Hi, I'm Suze. I'm a former economist and a comic, and I'm making lots of videos about economics and stuff that I don't really feel enough people are talking about. And this video is about the economic legacy of the British Empire, and specifically how it relates to our ideas around work. Now look, if you watch my other videos, you know that I normally say we're not just talking about economics, we're walking. But in this video, we're actually having a bit of a pause from the walking, and we're just gonna sit around in this pretty incredible location I'm in now. I'll tell you what it says in the video, and think about this topic that I think is really, really, really important. Thanks for joining me on this. Let's go and have a, let's not have a walk, let's have a sit. By the way, this is a really beautiful church, but there is some building works going on just there. Quite noisy. And one other thing I want to say before I start is that people always say to me, why are you going on about the past? You know, it's all history, isn't it? And I want to say, no, this isn't a video about the past. This is about stuff that we haven't seen about the past, so it's still with us in the present, right? I'm going to be talking in this video about the current economic impacts of the British Empire on how it influences our economy today, how our economy works, in fact, how we all work, the very idea of work. Look, let me put this another way. Someone else who understood this idea of the past and the present and the future being interlinked was Charles Dickens. So if you've read his book, A Christmas Carol, oh, by the way, I'm on Copperfield Street, which is named after a Charles Dickens novel. Can you guess which one? David Copperfield. Now, I'm going to talk about Charles Dickens a bit later as well, but for now, I just want to point out that that's kind of the theme of the Book of A Christmas Carol, is the links between the past, the present, and the future. So it's about a guy called Scrooge, you probably know the story. Scrooge wasn't a great guy, but he thought he was great. He thought, like many people I've come across, he thought he had no problems and everyone else had a problem. So he couldn't see what was going wrong in his present. So he was visited by some ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. They pointed out to him and showed him what he was actually like, and then he could change. So I think this is a very good metaphor for the British Empire. Uh, I think this is quite a good work of Charles Dickens. Um, other things that Charles Dickens have written, but we'll come to that later. Now look, one last thing before I start, I maybe should just tell you guys that I used to be an economist, I've got a PhD in economics, and one thing that I kind of specialised in was assessing economic impacts. And I just want to point out there are loads of different methods for doing this. And when we're looking at the British Empire, one method is to do the one that I most commonly hear, which is where people try and add up a financial, the financial value of, for example, everything that my ancestors looted from India. Or people try and somehow put a number on a value of the cost of the slave trade. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. And I tend to agree with people like Shashi Tharoor, William de la Rumpel, Kim de Andrews, who've pointed out that the number you get is so big that it actually poses a problem in itself of how that can ever be repaid. But I just want to point out I'm doing a slightly different method here, I'm not attempting to put a financial value on the legacy of empire, but I'm looking at how the British Empire has actually shaped the very concept of what we even think economics is. And there are loads of ways I think about this, but for now, this video, I'm going to focus on one, as I've already said, the idea of work. And I'll tell you like three ways the empire shaped our idea of work. I can think of more ways, but three is a good start, isn't it? Let's just do three. And shall I say it one more time, this isn't about the past. This is about the present. That's what this video is about. The way the empire is still around us in ways that we're not able to acknowledge because we haven't properly seen it. Now look, the last thing I'll say before we start is this is part of a series of videos I've been recording about the idea of work, and it's all based around walking around this area, which is Borough in central London. However, um, the rest of the videos I've been trying to keep quite light and make them kind of funny, but this video is going to be a break from that. I've been trying to find the right words to talk about this topic, and I don't know if I've got them yet, so but if I don't say anything, then I'll have said nothing, and that's what I accuse other people of doing. So anyway, um, that's what I'm going to say actually start this off and um, yeah that's that I think now we can start so we're not going to be walking a lot but I'm going to just walk around this beautiful little churchyard <laughs> So if you watched my last video, you'll know that 
I made the point that the idea of work is very much linked to the idea of paying rents. So we used the term working to pay the rent. And I tried to turn that on its head and said renting to pay the work, which I thought was quite clever. Thank you to the people that said it was also quite clever. But what I was trying to point out there is that the need to pay rents had to be created first for people to need to go out into particular types of work. And I'm not saying this is the only way that you can work, I'm just saying it is quite a key concept that we have today. Now, I came round here because there used to be a workhouse near here, and I was talking about the enclosures and workhouses in Britain. And the workhouse round here is the one that is sort of inspired Charles Dickens, to Oliver Twist. Now, I also just want to say how I came to be here in this churchyard, because I came on another day and it was blocked. So I thought I would film in the vicarage, which seemed like a really good place to film, um, until the people in the vicarage who lived there, I didn't realize no one lived there, they actually came home. And obviously I could have edited this out, but I thought I'd tell you this and be honest about it, because I think it highlights two things about British people. One is that sometimes British people don't really ask questions, so they just sort of let me stand in their garden and didn't ask me anything. And secondly, it highlights that British people sometimes can walk with some confidence onto other people's land. Now, I apologised and left and actually came back on a totally different day to film. However, some of my ancestors seem to have had a rather different idea. And you see, British people have just done this for centuries. They've gone overseas and even though people are already living on the land, they haven't really taken that as a cue to leave. And I'm not saying the British are the only people that have done this. Many other countries, particularly some European powers, have got some questions to answer too. Because I'm British, I feel the weight of this. That's what I'm talking about today. Now, before I go on, I wanted to ask you what you think the idea of establishing an empire actually means or colonising another country means. Now, I expect some of you watching will have given this a lot more thought than others, but I just want to point out that if you think it is just going to another country and living there and taking land, it's a lot more than that. The project of the British Empire was a lot, lot bigger in scope than that which is why the impact has been so big. So in this video, I'm just focusing on one aspect, as I said, our idea of work. So let's look at what happened in Jamaica. So this was a British colony, well, this was an English and a British colony from 1655 to 1962. Now, even after slavery had been abolished there, people that had been enslaved got no real apology, no compensation, there was no redress. And not only that, planters in Jamaica tried to keep wages really low for former slaves and also to charge them really high rent. As you can probably imagine, people that had been through slavery weren't mad keen on this state of affairs. And as Prem Varda Gopal points out, they had other ideas of how they wanted to live. They had ideas about controlling their own economic destiny and having their own land. Loads of different conceptions of what work is. So this is what I really want to point out first, is that there are other ideas of work which other people have had. For example, people in Jamaica who were former slaves, they set out a pretty clear vision of their idea of work, which was very different to the one that the Victorians set out, which is working for low wages and paying high rents. Two magpies for joy. So that's the first thing. Let's move. I'll show you a bit more of this lovely churchyard and I'll tell you the second thing, which really leads on from the first. So the first thing, just to recap, is that it wasn't just that the British took land, it's that they denied other people access to land and therefore forced those people to have to rent and therefore work for them to earn the wages to pay this rent. So I think I'll bring you over here and show you the fig tree. So here's the fig tree, which is really lovely. Figs. I mean, that is, those are figs, aren't they? I haven't got that wrong. So let's go back to Jamaica. It wasn't just that people in Jamaica were forced into working to earn wages to pay their rents. They were forced into a particular type of work to farm sugar. So as David Lasogas pointed out, the planters wanted to maintain a large landless workforce to revive the sugar economy. But I'm just pointing this out so that that's not clear. It wasn't just people were forced into work, but into particular types of work that benefited the colonizer and on aggregate benefited the whole economy of, the, of Britain, not necessarily of the countries that they were colonizing. And I also want to point out that not everyone in Britain benefited equally from this state of affairs, and I will be pointing that out a lot, basically, in my videos. And look, there are lots of different examples of this, all variations on a theme. So this one is about producing a cash crop, sugar for export. A second theme is 
um, meeting a gap in a British supply chain, like oil from the Middle East. A third variation is what happened in India with their own cotton industry, which I talk about in my video on the Industrial Revolution, and loads of other people have talked about as well. These are all different examples, but the theme or the overriding end point is the same. The whole country's economies end up being developed in ways that don't really benefit them, but actually benefit some particular elements of British society. And look, Britain's not the only empire to do this. Other empires have done this as well. The Roman Empire definitely did this. The difference seems to be that with those empires, it was a little bit more obvious. Whereas the weird thing about the British Empire is that everything's been twisted. And the story that's been told is that Britain was going to go and help these countries, help them develop, help them develop, help, help, help. So that's why it's so confusing. And um, why I think we're still unpicking the legacy today because so many weird stories have been told about it. Help them develop, help them develop, help, help, help. Um, it's just weird that we had to go there with guns to take stuff. Or we say that we went to mediate conflicts, but turns out we helped start a lot of the conflicts or made them worse by supplying all the guns. Anyway, that's what I'm gonna talk about next though. The third thing is about how the legacy of work has been very divisive. So let's move. There's two pigeons here, I really like them. So for my third point, I want to pick up on those divisions. But first of all, I want to talk about some of those weird stories that we're told. A lot of British people are proud of the British Empire because we're told a very misleading account of it in school. And it's weird because in most films, it's pretty clear the empire isn't the side that you want to be on. But somehow we've got a bit confused about the British Empire. We're sort of told it was a force for good. But I'd like to quote Princess Leia and suggest that maybe the force is in you. The force is with you. I don't know enough about Star Wars to quote Princess Leia. I don't even know if that is Princess Leia. Might be some kind of cross between David Bowie and Princess Leia, I don't know. Now there is this assumption that if you're British, you should support the British Empire. But Britain is about so much more than the Empire. And perhaps a more British thing to do could be to challenge it, to rebel, to resist. So I'm really drawing on the work of Priyan Vardagopal here, who's written a book full of examples of British people rebelling against the British Empire. These were in Britain and beyond. So for example, the Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865. I've already set out some of the context as to why former slaves were rebelling at this time period. But this rebellion, which was totally legitimate, was put down with horrific violence by the British governor, Edward Eyre. And I haven't got the right words for how violent it was. Like hundreds of innocent people were massacred, including women and children. Now, when this happened, as you might expect, lots of British people took the side of the former slaves. And this was particularly the case of working class movements who held up the Jamaican leaders as martyrs and heroes. And also there were meetings across the country where speakers invited people to see the connections between violence against people in the colonies and repression against British people back at home. However, unfortunately, a lot of London-based newspapers took the side of the governor who'd endorsed this massacre, as did lots of so-called liberal progressives like Charles Dickens, who turned out to be very racist. So there was this opportunity for repair and some redress of the grievances of the former slaves, and yet this was quashed and met with more divisions. And actually, Victorian society ended up being split into two on this issue. Now, I'm not going to be the first person to point out that a lot of British rulers have deliberately stoked up tension between different groups based on race, religion, class. There's even a proverb that if you see two fish fighting in a pond, then probably the British were involved. A much wiser and better people can point out how we can heal this racism and the legacy of all this. I'm learning about this too. However, what I want to do in this video is point out there's also a very divisive attitude to work that's been left by this. You thought about how divisive the way we even talk about work is. We talk about people losing jobs. We talk about jobs being stolen, about people coming over here, taking all the jobs. And we have this idea of there being a relentless competition for jobs. Now you might think, of course there needs to be competition for work, but I'm not sure. Like sure, if you're playing football or tennis, you want a bit of competition. But if you're finding your work, your life's purpose, 
I'm not sure that is something you should be competing other people for. I think it's more about you. So look, I looked up another Star Wars quote, which I think fits this book. It's from um, Maz Kanata or Maz Kanata. I'm not really a Star Wars expert, but it says, the belonging you seek is not behind you, it is ahead. I like that. I think it's quite profound. But there was a bee nest in that tree. A bee nest? So I haven't quite finished. I'm gonna go and sit under that tree and sum up, basically. Anyway, I'll show you the tree. So look, I'll attempt to summarize what I've said. I've made three points about the legacy of the British Empire on work. Point number one is that it forced people into particular type of work, which relied on low wages and paying rents. And there are other ideas of what work could be. And I'm not saying, by the way, that everyone wants to have land and farm it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there are other possibilities and options for work than working long hours to pay high rents. The second thing I've said is that the empire forced people and whole nations into particular types of work. And we're still unpicking the legacy of this today. This is all unraveling. It's had negative consequences for Britain as well, actually, what our economy is based upon. And I'll say more about that in other videos. And the third thing I've said is we left with a very divisive attitude to work around people taking jobs or stealing jobs. And in my view, the way that we work is dramatically changing. and It's going to be so different in the future. And yet we're somehow trying to hang on to the past. Um, we're trying to like bring jobs back or get things back that really have gone. We need to move somewhere different. So this is a housing co-op, is it? Westminster House. Do you mind being in it? I could film you. Don't, do you want it's a housing co-op, yeah. I understand. Yeah, last week or on the Sunday, there's a guy moving in. I'm supposed to close the gate, but he wanted to move his stuff in, so... Oh, that's so you yeah, helped. helped you that's very kind so of you. That's great. Yes, yeah, sorry, I actually kind of forgot to tell you about this churchyard, which is that it's um, no longer a church. It was a recording studio for a bit in the 80s and 90s, and Depeche Mode recorded an album here, so that's a bit of trivia. Um, but as... Carl, is that right? Has just said it is now a housing co-op um, and run a lot of the gardens run by volunteers and yes, yeah, pretty nice. You should come and check it out. Um, closes at now six ish every day. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah changes. But changes. Yeah, about six. About six. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thanks so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, then you can come with me and we're gonna pick up some of these themes in the rest of my walking tour about work. Um, if not, um, fine, you know, thanks for watching and um, yeah. I hadn't figured out what it was. I thought it was a housing co-op, but yeah, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, I was, I, I regretted afterwards. I could have gone down, I could have altered myself and said, oh, I'm going to have a look around. Yeah. Because I thought it was a housing co-op. Yeah. 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 Yeah.